Israel no longer produced crops, thus lack of food and polluted water produced malnutrition and disease. The Maya could no longer count on their kings to intercede with their gods because their great society was in a death spiral, and their kings so long counted on for guidance and prosperity were powerless to stop it. So sadly, but slowly and surely, the people voted with their feet, and the ancient Maya left their beautiful cities forever. There were no signs of mass graves. They did not vanish. Where did the millions of Maya go? If you wanted to go where it was happening, you moved north. Go, go north, young man. The cities that die in the south, and that's the only way to describe it, is they just go into oblivion, are never really replaced. But there are locations all around the Yucatan Peninsula where the cities not only thrive, but they begin to grow explosively. This growth was enhanced by an elaborate network of causeways called sock bays, or white roads. The sock bays weren't just local transport. They were emblems of the great political power of two allied cities that had the wherewithal to create this magnificent royal procession way between their two kingdoms. As much as 60 miles long in some places, they were a marvel of engineering. They would place huge rocks on both sides of the causeway and then filling whatever was in between with cobbles and unfinished rocks and stones. And then they cover all this surface with stucco, nice plaster. And then upon it, they create this smooth surface. In the Yucatan Peninsula, the sock bays often charted a course through the rough terrain in perfectly straight lines. It's not easy to cut a line 60 miles that doesn't deviate even a, even a degree. I would really like to know uh, what instruments they use. We have no record of it. These causeway systems allowed for rebirth, movement, and trade in the north. And it is there that the ragged survivors of the southern lowlands hope to find a second chance in a Yucatan city called Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza came to be the largest and most powerful city from about 800 to 1050 or so that had a real knack of being a big tent. So it was a very cosmopolitan place, and I'm sure it traded handsomely on that reputation. One of the buildings unique to the site was El Caracol, an astronomical observatory. The Maya were obsessed with both time and the stars and spent centuries looking to the sky for answers. The Maya probably had something called a gnomon, which is uh, a series of two crossed bars. And by looking at the intersection of those two bars, they were able to focus on something. With just basic tools, the Maya were able to track the movement of the stars and planets and the passing of time. Like Stonehenge, this was a place where people could make solar and lunar observations. The staircase in the front of the building faced 27.5 degrees northwest, out of line with other structures, but in almost perfect alignment with Venus's most northerly position in the sky. It was closely aligned with the celestial bodies and occurrences, such as the movement of Venus and the solstices, in the higher tower of the building, three openings survive today. They are small, narrow, and irregularly placed, but they align along astronomical sight lines. In the Caracol, we can see in its orientations, in its peculiar displacements, in its odd alignment of buildings, a focus on what Venus was doing at the time. Venus is a kind of variable. Uh, actor up there in the skies. Sometimes it moves in this direction, sometimes it moves in that direction. The caracol seems to be about looking at Venus when it's come to the end of a certain kind of motion. This astute astronomical observation allowed the Maya to build their interlocking calendars that were more accurate than any other used in the ancient world. The Maya had two calendars, one ritual and then, you know, the the solar calendar that is, that is very, very similar to what we use in the Western world. The Maya measured the solar year to be 365 days, 
their measurements for the revolution of Venus and the occurrence of lunar eclipses were equally on target. In just 200 years, the Maya had achieved a rebirth in the wake of the catastrophic destruction of their southern cities. But now the North would face an even deadlier enemy, one that was capable of annihilating the Maya while leaving their cities intact. Chichen Itza is renowned for its well of sacrifice. It is said that humans and precious objects were tossed into the sinkhole as offerings to the rain god Chalk. In the ninth century, the classic Maya city suddenly and mysteriously collapsed, ending the era of greatest prosperity and growth. Rebirth in the north gave the Maya an opportunity to combine astronomy and engineering on an unprecedented scale. At Chichen Itza, signs of continuing obsession with the skies left a permanent mark on Maya architecture. The cornerstone of Chichen Itza was the 98-foot El Castillo, or the castle, built in the 9th or 10th century. The 365 steps equal the number of days in the Maya civil calendar. 52 panels on each side represented the Maya's 52-year cycle. Nine terraced levels equaled the 18-month Maya solar calendar. And the temple's axis was perfectly aligned so that specific shadows were cast twice a year. For any Maya standing in, on, and looking at the northwestern sector of the Castillo, they would see a balustrade and then the combination of shadows and the sun hitting that part just before sunset. And then several triangles form. And then at the very bottom of, the, of this balustrade, you have a nice carved serpent head, a snake coming down from heaven. And that is indicating the arrival of the rainy season. The Maya saw this phenomenon as a manifestation of the deity Kukul Khan, the feathered serpent. The Mayas were able to actually record you know, the equinox. That day in the year where night and day, you know, last the same. Every year, March 21st, you see the descent of Kukul Khan. Surrounding El Castillo, the civic buildings took on a new characteristic, spaciousness, with a broad open plaza, temples, marketplaces, a ball court, and colonnades. So the colony hall not only housed uh, this, the, you know, the feasting events, but maybe individuals were brought into the plaza. You know, the general public was probably invited, depending on the occasions, to come to the plaza and witness the arrival of these you know, uh, traders, uh, the merchants. Greek or Roman in appearance, these round columns were used as a new type of structural support and were an architectural first in the Maya world. The benefit of a column is that it allows you to create flat roofs. You're not investing all of your energy in creating stone buildings that are going to be containing corbel vaults, which may or may not collapse. The columns were simple in design. Round drums were placed one on top of the other, filled with rubble in between. A square section was placed at the top, and then flat rooftops made of stucco and wood were added to form expansive covered interiors. It involves people more openly in the life of, what, of the building and of what's happening within it than would have been possible with Maya pyramids of the full classic period. Those pyramids are mostly about exclusivity. It's about showing a space, holding it up high, but allowing very, very few people to look into it. The open column structures are much more inviting. But the welcoming atmosphere didn't last long. After more than 200 years of domination over the Yucatan, Chichen Itza suffered a fate similar to its neighbors in the south. It mysteriously collapsed. When the Spanish arrived on the shores of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1517, every large cosmopolitan center of the Maya world had been abandoned. Even so, a splintered Maya civilization living in small villages across the countryside 
put up a sustained fight against the conquistadors. They proved difficult to conquer because rather than taking a